From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudy Mudder, and this matters. Canada has become a branch plant economy when it comes to drugs and the Mexican cartels. That is one of the many startling and bloody revelations in the just released book, The Wolf Pack, the millennial mobsters who brought chaos and the cartels to the Canadian underworld. This is a thorough and detailed look at modern day criminals, centering on the Wolf Pack Alliance, a loose knit organization of incredibly violent, diverse, digitally savvy criminals who rose in Canada during this century. The book is remarkable in how it shows these criminals face some of the same issues that other types of institutions are right now, like the friction between young and old sensibilities, the culture clash between Canadian criminals and their Mexican counterparts as they attempt to go global, and the age-old adage that all bosses lament. Even crime bosses, good help is hard to find. Through surveillance and text messages, it also shows how criminals communicate digitally now and how it can lead to their undoing. Peter Edwards is a reporter covering crime at the Star, who has also authored over 15 books on organized crime. Luis Najera is a journalist in exile from Mexico, who fled to Canada in 2008 because he feared for his and his family's safety due to his coverage. These gentlemen have collaborated to author The Wolf Pack, the millennial mobsters who brought chaos and the cartels to Canadian underworld. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining me today on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I've just read your book. It's a fascinating story about how the cartels from Mexico started working in Canada through the work of some criminals here. This is a fascinating and truly detailed story. I want to thank you for your work and in telling this story. And also, you know, just for being here, listen, I mentioned it just now, True Crime and Podcasts go really well together. Luis, I really want to talk to you a little bit about your particular personal experience, but I want to also just set the stage. So Peter, I think let's start with you. Who were the Wolf Pack Alliance? They're a pretty fascinating group because the big thing they had was that they were greedy. They were linked by kind of an obsession with the internet and they were generally under 35 and some were from the Hells Angels, some were from even unnamed groups, some were old Irish mob guys. It was just sort of a linkage and it wasn't any one geographic area. It was basically through greed and the internet and wanting to jump the line and not have to be bossed around by their bosses. Now, the book tells a story about these criminals, and one of the things about them, and I found it really interesting, is that traditionally when we talk about organized crime, criminal organizations are generally based on ethnicities, families, or based in a similar place. These guys were really young, diverse, and basically spread out all across Canada. I mean, I think the key part of this is they're also very millennial, right, Peter? Yeah, it's a bad side of being woke. Like, this is the ugly side of wokeness. So they're very spread out. They had a member in a wheelchair. They had every color, all sorts of languages. And we didn't find ethnic discrimination. We did find real nastiness. And what it did, them being so diverse, was it allowed them to hit a lot of different markets and escape a lot of different places. Like when things went bad, they were all over the world. Now, Luis, I'd like to bring you in here because part of the key is, gentlemen, while these guys were obviously doing bad things in Canada, their connection to the Mexican cartels was a huge thing. I want to say, what was that link? It was one of these things, at least in the beginning, were they basically, the cartels were their drug suppliers? Is that the best way to sort of study how this relationship sort of started? Yeah, they were clients. It was the beginning of very much a commercial relationship. They have a product, they have a need. So they got together and they started to doing business. That was the initial approach of the Wolfpack Alliance to the Mexican cartels. And then that evolved through the book. We see how this relationship evolved up to the point when the cartels decided to, you know what, I think it is time to settle and to overtake the power here and overtake the business. There's so much I want to unpack about this book, and there are so many things in it that you really wouldn't think about that show the difference between what we think of as the old school mob and these new school criminals. One of the most evocative things to me were the names. Like, you used to have things like the Cosa Nostra or the Andragada, but these new organizations in Canada were called the Wolfpack Alliance or the United Nations. As well, in terms of nicknames, you know, the old mafia guys had names like Pops, the Tall Guy, or the Discount Casket Guy. But these modern guys are using online handles like Zelda or Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Peter, let's talk a little bit about this. I think a lot was coming from comic books. I mean, Zelda was a female warrior. and Video game character. I will correct you there. Okay. Video game character <laughs> that I am fully aware of. Please, Peter, but go ahead. 
Okay, their top hit person called himself Zelda. And then when things went bad, someone changed his name to Run and Hide. And it seemed not really all that based in reality. And the top hit person liked to dress up like he had theatrical makeup. He probably had more makeup than, you know, some lead at Stratford. And so he had lots of guns, lots of makeup and charged all sorts of money. And the rest of them went along with it because they somehow thought that was good when they could have had the same job done for a lot less. You know, you don't have to hire some thespian to do the trick. But they seem to just like making a bang on the Internet, being noticed, making a loud noise. And if they hadn't made a loud noise, who would they be? They'd be lost out there. So they had to do something something quick. The old mafia guys, they like to just smirk and what is the mafia and you watch too many movies and you read too many books. And here, I talked to one old guy once who just said, here, have a coffee, relax and gave me a nice cup of coffee and said, you know, it's crazy other parts of the world, but here in Canada, it's nice and calm. Louise, let's go back to the cartel guys. I thought that some of the names that they used were very cool, like Carnalito. <laughs> Actually, Peter brings up this point, and I think that it also is illustrated when you write about the Mexican cartels. One of the other wars at play here is that this Wolfpack Alliance, very flashy, very loud, very silly, whereas the cartels and even the old school mobsters took this very seriously and very quietly. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, well, the flashiness and the flamboyant personalities is not only in Canada's millennial criminals, so to speak. This is a very generational thing, you want to say. So, you know, millennials, they were born with a phone in their hands, with the internet, with a keyboard, with those things. So they are very used to always checking the phone, posting, tweeting, Googling. So that's part of the personality. And this is a characteristic of this generation. So in that sense, if you move that or translate that into the criminal world, well, also in Mexico is very common. You can see there's Instagram accounts administrated by real gangsters that where they pose with tigers. They love, I don't know why they love tigers and lions as pets. But yeah, Black Panthers. And they pose with golden covered AK-47s. And they have stories with driving Lamborghinis in Culiacan. So those kind of things. So this is very particular in this generation. And it's a big difference because it's the first generation that has this kind of behavior, digital behavior. Meanwhile, you go back to the older guys, they, as Peter mentioned, quiet, calm. Sometimes the analogy that we use is think about Tony Soprano. If you see Tony Soprano on the street, he looks even approachable, like, you know, a chubby guy, almost like your uncle, paternal guy, like, oh, a cool guy. And then you have the millennial like Nick Nero, bodybuilder with jewelry, and they have these fancy cars and they like to expose themselves driving these cars. So that's the big shift in behavior and mindset, sort of. In that also includes the way that they do business, how they communicate with their suppliers in Mexico using PGP, I mean, private communications, encrypted communications. So it's different than nicknames. Yeah, you can see it's a big difference. And for instance, Carnalito means little brother in Mexico, which is a very common word. To me, this means probably that this was a way to create some kind of trust. You know, I'm your carnalito, I'm your little brother. We can do business instead of, you know, I'm Ninja Turtle or Zelda or whatever they want to call them here. Well, you mentioned Nick Nero, who is one of the sort of main characters in the story, one of the bosses. And honestly, I got to say, one of the things, Peter, about this wolf flack is that they just don't come off as being very bright. Like, these guys are not criminal masterminds. And I've got to say, like, there was just this section that I found hilarious where they just had trouble finding people who could accurately test the cocaine. And we just read it in text messages going back and forth. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, Nick Nero, someone who knew him called him dumb as a bag of hair, and then he started feeling guilty to any bag of hair out there that was being compared to him. He traded up in Ferraris when he was claiming to be broke. He just mistreated people just for the kind of the fun of it. Just way, way, way into steroids, bodybuilding, that sort of lifestyle. And someone phoned me up after that passage ran in the star about him being dumb as a bag of hair. Someone who knows him and he started off being angry at me and then he started laughing and started telling Nick Nero jokes. But on the other hand, he bought his way in. I mean, he had a ton of money. He robbed an armored car. So he kind of bought his way into the game and then he couldn't remember his password. So they had this great encryption system, but he couldn't remember how to sign on. So he put it on a post-it note and left it on his computer for at least three months and so when police were sneaking around his place it was like a guided tour to his sad little mind we'll be right back
this is a fascinating thing. And one of the highlights of the book to me was this digital trail where you just see all these guys communicating and they just don't realize that there's this window into them. But guys, you are both acclaimed crime reporters in your countries, and the collaboration here is the thing that I think is really interesting. Peter, it's funny. You've been on a lot of times, and every once in a while, you say a throwaway line that I'm just like, what? And then I remember reading it, and there was a passage in there which really struck me that is sort of the perfect sort of comparison. And it was sort of the difference in standard operating procedure between these types of organizations. I believe you're right. I'm paraphrasing. In Canada, bikers and gangs... They don't really target families of the rivals of criminals. It's basically they stay there. Whereas in Mexico, that's standard operating procedure. You go after sort of everybody involved in the family. Can we talk a little bit about the differences and the ruthlessness there? Because, again, Peter, you're also right. These guys are hitmen. They kill a lot of people in this book. Yeah, I know one guy who's a hell's angel who had quite an active one, and he said it's gangsters rolling over gangsters. And so, you know, it's like they all agreed to the game and it's a rough game. And he prides himself on staying away from families. And as long as I stay in my lane and I'm a journalist, I feel safe, you know, talking to that guy. But with the Wolfpack or the ones we're looking at, it was way different because they kill someone just for a connection or just to scare someone. There was one guy who one of his workers was accused of talking to police and he said, my men don't do that. They know I'd kill their families. And so that was like a compliment to his men, but it also was like they did know he would kill his families. There's someone who was killed, a restaurant owner on Roncesvalles, and we don't think he had anything to do directly with crime, but he was related to someone who was accused of cheating a cartel. And so they wanted to make a point. And so they made a very loud point by killing him. The idea of going outside of the lines, it does keep people in line and you just don't rip these guys off. It used to be kind of smirky where the drugs get close to Toronto and everybody starts ripping everybody else off. And it's almost like a new game, you know, when it gets close to here. With this, you just do not rip them off. There'll be blood, you know, if you do. Louise, obviously this is an area of your expertise. Can you talk a little about the cartels and how ruthless they are? Well, times change. Again, new generations. And also the greed. It's also very important here because in the past, you have, at least in Mexico, you have four strong consolidated groups. Tijuana, Juarez, the Gulf, and Pacifico. So you have these organizations and everybody knew their place. And of course, for instance, family was something that you never touch. But then time change, organizations fracture and chaos began. And now, for instance, families are frequently targeted. There's a story, for instance, after one of a big drug lord was arrested, the cartel found the name of one of the Marines who participated in the raid. And they went to the town, a small village, and they killed the family of this Marine. So these kind of things are happening more frequently. And of course, they like to do those kind of crimes in a very public way. They kill the family or they record videos. They dismember the bodies and they put it next to cardboards telling, oh, this person was murdered by me because he or she did this. And they dump the bodies, for instance, cases where bodies had been dumped outside of the major's office or the police station. So those kind of things, this is how bad the situation is there. And Peter and I talk about it. Probably this new, this modern times, this new generation, they also, because of the internet and because of the access to the world, probably they are, you know, getting information from, for instance, from the cartels on how they do business there. And they are bringing these things into here somehow, of course, with the resources they have, and with the capacity they have. But they like to do, like Peter said, like very dramatic, triatical ways, like killing people, killing one guy outside of a restaurant in the middle of the Euro Cup. So those kind of things. So again, this is part of the new reality of organized crime. Now, <laughs> this is going to sound a bit strange too, but I got to say that the other theme here to me is that it's really hard to find good help. It seems like all the henchmen are really a constant source of issues for their bosses. <laughs> Peter, what do you have to say to that? I agree. On the other hand, I mean, we learn about the dumb ones who get caught. And so there still are lots of drugs out there. One thing that blew us away was this book was written during the pandemic. And I had been ready for drugs to dry up a bit. And I thought, what are they going to do when they run out of the prime drugs? Are they going to goose it up with fentanyl? Or what are they going to do? And they actually just kept it moving. Like Louise pointed out that these people have been smuggling for a while. They know what they're doing. The border's being frozen. You know, so what? I mean, they're just really good at smuggling. And so there never was a time when we're working on the book where, oops, you know, the drugs have all dried up. What are they going to do now? They didn't need a plan B, like plan A was pretty good. 
I mean, they were Plan Bs, but the pipeline was very strong. And one thing we found, too, that was interesting was that the cartels held back drugs. Like they'd bring in a certain amount, but they keep quite a bit to themselves. And that way they could influence different sides. You don't want anyone to become so powerful they can challenge you. So you prop up a whole bunch of them. It's almost like if you're an arms runner, you don't want one side to win the war quickly. You want them to fight it out for quite a while. Or if you're a divorce lawyer, you don't want a quick settlement. You want a 20-year battle. You know, like it's the same sort of idea. So, Luis, as you find it in the book, the cartels have a lot of issues with their Canadian connections. So they basically decide that they have to come up here and handle their own business. I'm curious as to where things are now. Is it fair to say that they're here and well-established now? Oh, yeah, of course they are. Yeah, they are really well-established. They are operating here. And as Peter mentioned, one of the strategies was to, okay, we bring the drug. It's almost like Costco. I have the warehouse. You come to my warehouse. I can sell you. But also, if another guy from another group comes, I will sell also to this different group as a way to keep the market operating, but also I have also my own market. And at some point, we believe that they are going to somehow overtake fully in the sense of, okay, we are the main supplier, again, like the Costco. Okay, we are Costco. You need something, come to us. We'll sell it to you, but we keep control of everything. So that's pretty much the reality right now. And this is also how this is bringing new different moving parts into this equation. And of course, with consequences for sure. So this is a fascinating story. Lewis, you're obviously a journalist in exile. Your life was threatened by your coverage. I want to bring out something that you wrote in the beginning, the foreword of this book, that I just found really remarkable, a piece of logic. It was one of these things where it was said that you cited that when you were forced to leave Mexico, you considered the U.S., but you chose Canada because you knew members of organized crime families chose to hide their families here. That, to me, is a really remarkable piece of logic. You're like, okay, wait a second. The bad guys are hiding people up there, so I think maybe that's safer for me. One, now you've been here for 12 plus years and you've written this book. What do you think about your decision? And now that you know how established the cartels are here. I'm okay. I'm really happy. I'd say the non-professional side of me is extremely happy because, I mean, if compared with the states and we live at the border and in Texas, so you can imagine the environment in Texas, how complicated it is for immigrants. So in that sense, I'm super happy that we came here. I mean, the country is welcoming to immigrants and you can keep your culture while you can blend with the Canadian culture or with the other cultures here. Professional, well, it was a surprise to me at the beginning. And I told the story when I found this container in the middle of the street in Surrey 13 years ago. But that was kind of the eye opener. And since then, I've been more. It was a container full of drugs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Full of drugs, exactly. And from that, I said, well, okay, well, this is a global phenomenon. This is something new, somehow unexpected, but okay, here we are. And I guess my professional development in that sense, well, led me to collaborate with Peter and bringing this book to life. Gentlemen, we're almost out of time. This has been fantastic for us. I just wanted to know, is there anything I didn't ask that you think our listeners should know? Whatever happens to the actual wolf pack as a group, this is the model that will carry on. I mean, the idea of a multi-ethnic right across Canada, no big clubhouse, tapping into the big supplier, impatient millennials doing very violent things to be noticed. This is the future. It's a present too. The Godfather is, there's a lot that's happened since 1974 or whenever that came out. Yeah. And the other thing is, I guess this is a great example of why the drugs trade has to be seen, at least here in Canada, from a public health approach rather than just, you know, attacking and criminal. It's important. Yes, you have to fight these criminal organizations, particularly money laundering here in Canada. It's a big, big issue. Gentlemen, it's a fascinating book. I thank you for writing it and I thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter Edwards is a reporter covering crime at the Star. Luis Najera is a journalist in exile who covered crime in Mexico. They co-authored The Wolf Pack, the millennial mobsters who brought chaos and the cartels to the Canadian underworld. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Raju Mudder. Our This Matters team is Adrian Chung, Brian Bradley, J.P. Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bockneck, Saba Etizaz, and Sean Pattenden. Our music is by so-called Mike DeAngelis and Sean Pattenden. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. <laughs>